Hello everyone, uh, it's 12 o'clock so let's get started. Uh, a quick hello from me first, my name is John, I'm the director and founder of Uni Taste Days. Thank you to so many people for coming in and joining this webinar. Basically we're going to be doing these webinars every single Tuesday at 12 o'clock and um, quite simply to support students, post-16 students with university. So um, we all know there's, there's challenges going on at the moment um, but what we want to do at Uni Taste Days is ensure that every single week you get a different aspect of university guidance um, as well as that you also hear from a different university and um, to really support you in the future whatever you decide when it comes to university uh, i'll give each speaker a, a formal introduction just before we um hear from them um but just to let you know who, we've, who who's joining us today we've got uh, robbie from the university of bath um, robbie heads up uh, undergraduate recruitment at bath um, he's going to do a session all about covid19 but but concentrating on obviously universities and and, this, and what universities are doing to support students um, during the, the current challenges that, that we're all seeing. Um, we're also then going to be joined by Rebecca Bowen. Um, Rebecca is the Senior Student Recruitment Officer at the University of South Wales um, and, basically, and, and also the um, Interim Head of Welsh. Welsh. And, and Becca's going to talk about, uh, talk about personal statements and give you some real top tips when working on your personal statement, which I'm sure will be really, really handy. Um, and then last but certainly but no means least, um, Andy Cottrell from City University of London. Is going to join us. Um, he's going to. He's the UK marketing recruitment officer over at City University London, and Andy's going to talk about university and careers, um, and, and essentially what careers people that go to university often go on to do. Um, but ask answer a lot of questions as well in relation to a lot of concerns that students have in relation to university and and, and what career you might go on to do in the future. Uh, a few little bits and bobs from me first. Um, right at the start of the session, I mentioned that we're we're doing these sessions every single Tuesday. So if you have enjoyed today. Um, please go on to our unitasters.com, have a look at the Unitaster Tuesday page and have a look at upcoming events. So we've got uh, every single May event has been announced. So that's next Tuesday, the Tuesday after and the Tuesday after that. We're also running subject specialist events. So if you're interested in, in studying particular subjects and want to know more about university guidance relations in relation to those, um, it's also a great opportunity to find out about subject stuff as well. Um, and we're just doing all we can um, to support you as much as we possibly can, given the current challenges. Uh, a few other bits and bobs. The Q and A is open, so if you've got any questions throughout this this session, the Q and A is open. So please do ask the speakers questions. Um, what I don't want to do is is, is answer them all at the end. Um, what what we're going to do is is actually keep the Q and A open, and throughout the session, give you the opportunity throughout to answer, ask questions and get answers. So you'll see the Q and A tab right at the, the foot of the page. Um, please start using it, um, and we'll answer as the session progresses. Uh, in terms of actual format, and um, this is the final bit from me before I, I pass on to our first speaker, but in terms of format, so you know what to expect during the session, we're basically going to hear from each speaker for about 10 minutes or so um, about their particular area of university guidance they're going to cover. Um, and then we've got the Q&A running alongside that. If, there, if there's one question in the Q&A that's coming up a lot, um, as the host, I might jump in and, and ask that speaker that, that question, um, but it might be that we just, we just leave Q&A to um, the Q&A tab right at the foot of the screen. Um, and then right at the end of the, the session, um, I'm very conscious at the moment that, that people can't obviously attend University Open Days in person. And you might be watching this really wanting to know more about the University of Bath, City University of London or the University of South Wales. So right at the end of the session, um, I ask each speaker just to do a one minute introduction about their institution. And the reason I'm doing that is, is again, because you can't attend Open Days, it just is another opportunity where speakers are all in one place and that should be really handy for you. Um, but enough from me. Um, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from our fantastic speakers. So without further ado, um, I'm now going to pass the floor to Robbie Pickles. Robbie is the head of undergraduate recruitment at the University of Bath. Um, he has got a really difficult subject um, to speak about today because um, Robbie's talking about COVID-19 and, and, and the support for students in relation to that the university are doing. The reason Robbie, Robbie's job is particularly hard is there was a big announcement yesterday about, about various bits and bobs, which I'm sure Robbie's going to cover. So. Um, thank you very much, Robbie, for, for doing this session. Um, I've got to say, I couldn't, I couldn't wish for anyone better to do the session than Robbie. I've known Robbie for, for a very long time. So without further ado, um, let me pass the floor to Robbie. Um, Robbie Pickles from the University of Bath. Thank you. Okay, hey, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for uh, tuning in and for listening to me. I will only speak in for about uh, 10 minutes. This is a massive topic. Um, so I'm going to try and cram in uh, as much as I possibly can. And I hope that this will be valuable. 
uh, for you. Um, and if you have got any questions, absolutely do ask them. There will be more questions than I can possibly answer in the time. So please do uh, jump in and I can answer questions after the session or the other uh, speakers can, can, can get on those uh, sooner. Um, I guess the first thing to say uh, is that we know what a difficult time this is for everybody, whether you're in your final year and you're facing disruption to your exams, whether you're in your uh, first year maybe at sixth form, but you, you, you know, your studies have been disrupted, you might be doing your GCSEs and you might have similar uh, challenges. Universities are aware of that and it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that universities aren't corporations, they're not businesses, they're just groups of people. Um, and like all people, we're facing a challenging time uh, as well. There's a reason why I'm sat here in my spare room, not in my office at the university. Um, and, you know, as people, we empathise <laughs> with all of the situation uh, that everybody's going through. And, you know, we, we recognise that this is a difficult time. I think the thing to really emphasise is, whilst obviously everybody's lives have been disrupted, most people's lives are quite normal. So for me, my life next year, my life last year will be pretty much the same. I think the thing we recognise for people in your situation is that you're at a kind of fork in the road. You've got decisions to make, uh, choices to consider, options to consider. So the disruption you're facing is an order of magnitude greater than for a lot of other people. And it's just worth me stating straight out that universities are empathetic of that. We are understand it and we also know that it could potentially be causing for some of you some stress some anxiety some challenge uh, and we want to do everything we can as universities to support you to help you and to give you clarity so I think it's just important for you to be aware of that and I'll talk a little bit more about how we can support you um, through the session um, because I'm stuck at home uh, I've been watching a lot of television, as I'm sure a lot of you have, and uh, I've been re-watching for the first time, I haven't seen them since they were in the cinema, the Harry Potter uh, films, and I've just got to the end of the Chamber of Secrets, and um, after what must have been a very difficult year, what with everybody, you know, being attacked by a big snake, um, Dumbledore says, all the exams are cancelled, and everybody cheers, and it's the best thing that's ever happened uh, in the school. Um, I think probably for those of you who are experiencing an exam cancellation scenario, you're not necessarily jumping for joy because I think one of the things that you experience when these things happen in real life is that actually they cause significant disruption. So I think the first thing just to say is we, we get that. Um, so where, where people are having disruption to their exams, where people are having uh, challenges to getting the grades, they're worried about what grades they might get, how they're going to be assessed, we, we know that that's a, a problem. I think one of the things to say, just to reassure you, is that it's a global problem and universities are global in their reach. So we're not just supporting students who are doing their A-levels or the International Baccalaureate or students who are doing BTECs uh, or other qualifications, Scottish hires perhaps. Um, we're also supporting students who are in China, in America, in India, wherever in the world they might be. And they are being disrupted in similar ways. They're being disrupted in different ways. And we, we get that as well. So the support that we're providing to students at the moment is kind of taken into account a huge range of needs of different people and we're doing everything we can as universities uh, to respond to all of those different needs and to make sure that where we can uh, we can do what we can. The key thing to remember is that as universities when students come to us the thing we want them to do is to succeed. We want students who come on our courses to do well, we want them to thrive uh, when they come to university. So there's a really difficult balance for us around saying, yes, of course, we still want students to come to university, students who are getting good grades, who, who are capable of succeeding, we absolutely want them to come. But we also need to make sure that if students do come to university, uh, they do well. And that's something that's a key consideration for uh, admission staff that we're working on at the moment. And we're, as a sector, as a group of universities, in a constant dialogue with exam boards uh, and with other groups uh, to kind of find out what's going on. We're also in dialogue with the government, as you'd expect. So there's all sorts of behind the scenes stuff um, going on. So I think the first point from me would be, we know it's a challenging time and we're doing what we can to try and respond to a very difficult situation uh, to support you. Um, and I think the second point that I would make, and this applies just as much to students who are going in their final year now and who are waiting for final results as it does to people who are having disrupted studies or who are perhaps sitting earlier examinations. I think in most cases, universities will seek not to unfairly penalise people uh, who've been through this situation 
situation. So whether that's people entering university now, or perhaps if you're applying to university in two years, you know, we might understand that there was some disruption to your exams then as well, if there's particular things that we expected from uh, GCSE performance or similar. So we, we get that. And I think universities will try and do what they can to support you and to make sure that you're not penalised against. Uh, at the same time, it's worth recognising that every university is different. There won't be a national response to this. There will be individual university responses and how Bath responds and how uh, Lancaster responds and how Sheffield responds may be different. Uh, and that's quite normal. Um, so it is worth uh, finding out how a university you may have applied to or may be thinking about applying to uh, will respond to this and that information should usually be uh, publicly available or, or available directly to offer holders and if it's not I'll, I'll come to that in a moment um, but the key thing is people are reviewing their practices so for example uh, at Bath we make a huge number of offers to students which uh, require them to sit a science practical as part of their A level, you have to complete it. Uh, and you know, at the moment, we're kind of looking at reviewing that and saying, well, <laughs> realistically, a lot of people aren't going to complete it. Obviously, we're going to have to look again at what, what we would normally require there. And all those kind of conversations uh, are going on at the moment. Um, and the key thing I would say is people are working together on this. So UCAS uh, are working with us. We're working with the Office for Students, which is part of the government. So there's a whole load of things going on. And that's part of where there was an announcement um, this weekend uh, around sort of making sure that universities have good practice and are, are genuinely supporting students which i'm sure most of them will be uh, anyway so as, as a kind of second point i would say universities will be trying to make sure that people don't find themselves in a in a negative situation as a result of what is a very difficult uh, scenario the third point that I would make is that most universities already have a process for considering what we would call mitigating circumstances, which are where somebody has something that happens which causes them to typically do less well than they might have expected. And mitigating circumstances occur all the time. It might be that somebody has something happen in their life which is challenging or disruptive, or which has uh, in some way detracted or distracted from uh, performance in examination or similar. Um, and most universities will have a process for, for dealing with that. Some universities will be using that process now. Some may have set up a new process, but the key thing to be aware of is universities have experience of dealing with this. So even though this is a, a new situation, we, we don't normally have this particular circumstance, universities do have processes for dealing with difficult circumstances. So if you, feel that you are particularly penalised by this situation, that something has in some way gone beyond, then it is worth getting in touch with universities to explain that. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. It's worth bearing in mind, of course, that we know the typical circumstances. So if, if, if you're getting in touch just to say, obviously my exams have been disrupted, you don't necessarily need to raise that individually, although you're welcome to if you're concerned, and as I say, I'll come to that in a second. But if there's something that you think has had a particular impact on you, because we are aware that whilst this is a, a global problem, different people are experiencing this in different ways, and that's, that's completely normal. So if there are challenges, you should get, get in touch. So as a third point, therefore, if there is something unique to you, something you're very concerned about, you should talk to us. And that kind of brings me to the, the fourth point, which is, if you're, if you're in doubt, if you're concerned, if you're worried, you should talk to us and you can talk to us at any time uh, and you should do so if you're, if you're worried. Um, when I speak to students, uh, normally, although I'm not doing this at the moment, normally I'd be out and about all around the country speaking to students and when I speak to people they often worry that if they contact university they'll be sort of disrupting us that you know some you know science professor will be mid-experiment and you'll ring and they'll drop his chest tube or something no it's, it's, it's not like that you know we have people whose job is just to respond to queries and concerns um, you know if you've got through to bath it may well be me you'd be talking to other universities will have people too and if you have any concern at all, if there's anything that's worrying you, anything that you're not sure about, you don't understand, anything that you need additional information on, please do ask. And you can ask uh, any university you've applied to, any university you're thinking about applying to. Frankly, you could ask any university that you're not even thinking about applying to. As someone who's thinking about coming to university, who has questions, considerations, concerned, uh, concerns, getting in touch and asking is always the best thing to do. And again, different units will do it differently. It might be email, it might be phone, there might be um, live chat opportunities, there might be events that you can take part in. But please do ask if you have 
uh, any questions or any concerns. Uh, now the final thing I'm just going to say, although as I said I will take uh, questions, is around this year. I'm conscious some people who are uh, tuned in will be um, thinking about going to university this September. There's a huge question which if I don't address it you'll all just ask it anyway which is is term going to start as normal? So will universities resume teaching in the normal way uh, in September or October? Um, and the answer to that question is I, I don't know uh, and to be clear that's not because I don't know at this point it's because hardly anybody knows the, the real challenge that universities are facing is that we actually don't know uh, where the lockdown will go we don't know what government advice is likely to be in the short or medium term and obviously that has an effect on, on everybody's movement on, on what people are doing um, but what I do know is that universities will want to communicate that as soon as they can and what is happening is that universities are having extensive conversations about what may and may not be possible and universities are having conversations about whether people can just come back in the normal way or whether they come back a little bit later or whether there is um, I guess what you might think of as blended learning a bit of online learning maybe a bit face to face or perhaps different for different year groups perhaps you know, I'm making this up perhaps first years come to campus and second years don't or something like that those are the sorts of things universities are talking about the key thing for you to be aware of is as far as I'm aware I don't think anybody's decided yet if they have it, it, it's still just starting to, to happen so lots of universities will be talking about this right now um, and every university I know all, all the ones I'm talking to are clear that they want to make sure that whatever is agreed and decided is good and is a good experience. So even if it might not be the experience you were hoping for, and I completely accept that for some people, they may feel that what's decided by some unis might not might not be what they were what they were hoping for, um, that it will be a good learning experience um, and that it will be a fun experience. And where possible that they'll try and replicate some of the things that particularly for first years are really important. The orientation, getting to know people, making friends, feeling part of the institution. Universities are talking really, really quite um, seriously about how they can replicate that kind of thing if in a scenario where we can't resume study on campus on site uh, that, that you know we might have to do something else so I just be reassured that whilst things may be disrupted we don't know and we'll have to wait and see uh, all the universities I know are working really hard to do what they can and also doing what they can to support you to make sure that you know they can do the best they can to make it a good student experience Okay, so I, th I think that's my 10 minutes well and truly up. That's everything I've got to say uh, for now, and I hope that's helpful information uh, and advice. Um, if there are any questions, uh, John might ask me some in a moment. Otherwise, please do uh, put some into the, into the Q&A. Thank you, Robbie. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, such a, a difficult subject to, to talk about in 10 minutes. Um, you did a sterling job, so thank you. Uh, rather than go to the Q&A now with Robbie, um, I'm conscious that, that the Q&A tab is incredibly popular. We've got um, lots and lots of questions that have come in um, from, from lots and lots of people, which is absolutely fantastic. So we're going to work through the questions as much as we can using the Q&A, um, but there is over 200 people watching this and, and lots of you are ask, answering, asking questions. So um, that's wonderful. Um, we'll do our best to work through them. And then if there's time right at the end, that's okay, I'll right. right. uh, ask some questions then. Um, moving swiftly on, if I can, to our next speaker, um, another person I know really well from the sector, and that's Rebecca Bowen. Uh, Rebecca is the Senior Student Recruitment Officer at the University of South Wales. Um, as well as that, um, she's also the Interim Head of Welsh as well. And Rebecca is going to talk about something that all students ask so much, and that's for top tips in relation to personal statements. Um, this is something I, I know um, I've, I've seen Rebecca present on this subject before um, and she provides some fantastic advice so I'm really keen to have the same today so without further ado um, I'm going to pass the floor over to Rebecca um, and she'll give some, some top tips. Hi, am I on? Yeah, sorry. Hi everyone. Uh, as we heard, my name's Rebecca and um, I've got 10 minutes to talk to you about the personal statement and what makes a good personal statement. Uh, the nice thing about this session is that even if you're sitting here thinking, oh, I'm not sure about university next year, but I'm thinking about applying for another kind of option, maybe an apprenticeship, maybe a job, that type of thing. The personal statement, what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be relevant 
for other applications as well. Um, the, to be able to put down on a piece of paper all of the things that you're good at, your strengths, your skills, your experiences is, is a really important um, skill to have. In the context of university applications, then the personal statement is a 4,000 character uh, piece, of, piece of writing. And um, it's your opportunity to sell yourself. It's your opportunity to tell universities why you're the right person for that course for their university. Why is it important? Your UCAS, your university application, is a list of very valuable information to us, personal details, and um, grades, predicted grades. But obviously, we don't, we don't really get a sense of the other experiences, the other things that you've done that make you a strong candidate for, for a, a particular course. So your personal statement is your chance to talk to us, to tell us about all these fantastic things that you've been involved with. There's two main questions that you need to answer on your personal statement. First of all is why this course? That's the first thing that we want to read about as universities. Why have you chosen this course? There's over 30,000 course options available just in the UK alone. So why have you chosen this particular course and why are you going to be good at it? So that's question two then. Why should we as universities choose you? What can you tell us? that's going to make us think that you're the right person for the course. The kinds of things you might want to talk about here then are the kind of skills that you've got, um, work experience perhaps, and I'll talk a little bit more about work experience because I know I've seen the q and I, I know that it is a concern for a lot of students at the moment who might have had work pla experience placements cancelled as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. And um, we also want to hear about what, what you've been studying, the things that you've enjoyed doing as part of your A-level or your BTEC studies. And we also want to hear a little bit about your career plans. Okay, you're thinking about university, but what comes next? I would say that the opening line is one of the most challenging parts of, of any personal statement of, of kind of get it, getting it underway. And um, it's sometimes something the students leave till the end until they've got a better idea of the direction of the content of their personal statement. And um, it's really, really hard to come up with something that's interesting, this that sort of grabs the attention, but isn't too cheesy, overused. Um, some examples that I've seen thousands of times on draft personal statements um, with school and college students are things like, ever since I was young, I've wanted to be a, you know, a midwife. Ever since I was eight years old, I wanted to be a civil engineer. We're looking for something much more specific than that. And actually, is that true? Were you thinking about being a civil engineer when you were eight years old? Probably not. So having to think about striking the balance between something that's quite interesting, grabs the attention and, and makes us want to read on. In I'm going to give you a couple of examples, um, just really briefly, um, something for you to think about. So um, in a lot of personal statements, we might see something like this. You've talked a little bit about the course and then you're thinking about other experience, other things that you've, you've, um, you've done or you've, you've kind of experiences that you've gained. And you might say something like, I'm the captain of the school hockey team and I excel at most other sports. Okay, that's fine. Get a sense that you're quite sporty. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's a really good example of somewhere where you could give us a bit more information that would really elevate and really, really add value to your personal statements. Okay, you're captain of the school hockey team. So that tells us that you're probably a good leader. Why were you chosen as the captain? What, what sort of qualities, what sort of... Um, skills you know all those kind of things what, what made you a good choice uh, as captain and also if you are captain of a sports team and good at other sports the chances are that you're having to balance sporting responsibilities and sporting commitments alongside other things could be part-time job school or college work and um, other things other responsibilities so that demonstrates to us that you're good you've got good time management skills and that you're able to balance those things and also, it's good experience for what comes next at university and how you're going to balance um, other things. There'll be more social opportunities, perhaps, than you've ever experienced before. So how you're balance, balancing the social alongside, obviously, the, the important bit, the, uh, the studies and the lectures and, and, and uh, assignment deadlines and that type of thing. I am conscious of time, but I'm going to run through just a very sort of brief example structure of where you can start with a personal statement. And what I would say is, 
as difficult as it is at the moment to be sort of perhaps stuck at home and spending a lot more time on, on social media and devices and things like that, it is a good time to think about and really reflect on the experiences you've had to date and start writing them down. It might even be in a note section on your phone or on a piece of paper that you can come back to and think, oh, that's something that will be useful. Just a real sort of series of ideas and, and um, things that you've done that are going to kind of um, build up to a really good personal statement when you're ready to, to, to put a bit more, um, bit more work into it. So the example structure then, first point, without a doubt, is why this course? That's what we expect to hear about first. Why this course? Why have you chosen it? What, what inspired you? Have you uh, is there someone in the family who's doing something similar? Is this something that you've done on work experience? Have you had a, a teacher who might have inspired you to kind of pursue this more? Has it come from an interest um, that, uh, in a subject that you're studying at the moment, maybe a GCSE even, and that's where that kind of interest has come from? But without a doubt, that's the key sort of paragraphs for us as the starting point for the personal statement, why this course, why you, why will you be good at this, what will, what will you offer um, if you were successful and got a place on this course. Secondly, you could talk about things like work experience. Um, work experience is valuable and um, a short period even of, of relevant work experience can really sort of lift a personal statement and um, it gives you something to say and it shows that you've kind of explored the, the industry or explored the subject area in more detail outside of anything you might have been doing in school or college already. I would also say that it's important not to undervalue any part-time work that you might be doing. Um, often students think that a part-time job in Tesco's perhaps isn't, isn't the most valuable thing to include. And in isolation, probably not, that you've got a Saturday job in Tesco's. But actually, the experience that you might have gained from holding down a part-time job in Tesco's in terms of customer service, communication skills, working in a team, balancing again, school work, college work with working um, on a weekend or, or whenever it might be. So don't undervalue your part-time job if you've got one and the skills it might have given you. In terms of relevant work experience, I appreciate it is difficult, particularly for students who are thinking about medicine, dentistry, veterinary science, where placements have been cancelled. Um, it's, it's difficult to predict when there might be an opportunity for you to kind of rebook and re kind of undertake those those placements again. But I would what I would suggest is are there things that you could be doing and um, that you could talk about on personal statements. So it might be obviously making sure you stay staying safe and, and, and adhering to all the relevant protocols. But are there things that you can get involved with and um, via social media and um, volunteering, helping in the community, that type of thing again safely but are they the sort of things that you could talk about on a work ex on a personal statement for one of those courses and um, so i appreciate it's not quite the same as having a play work experience in a, a placement in a hospital but as robbie's alluded to we are aware as a community of universities we are aware that undertaking relevant work experience particularly in medical fields is going to be more challenging for, for the foreseeable future so that would be my advice to, to students who are thinking about that at the moment um, as well as those things, also thinking about other achievements then you could talk about in your personal statement or other responsibilities. So it might have been you've been involved um, as a prefect, you might have helped out organising some events in school or college, you might have supported younger students with reading or other classroom activities. Are there other things that you can say that you've done that have helped you build some really valuable skills that you can share with us in your personal statement. And we also want to hear a little bit about what you do in your free time. This should be quite a small part of the personal statement. We don't want a really long paragraph over all the, the kind of hobbies and, and things, but are there things you do outside of school, just something you've arranged by us outside of school, college, sorry, that you've arranged by yourself that actually tell us a lot about you and your commitment to your future course and your future university career. Um, just to finish off then, a couple of do's and don'ts, and, a, and a, again, a really valuable thing which has been around for a long time, which came from UCAS. So if you remember one thing from my section of this webinar, is the personal statement ABC. So it's activity, benefit, course. So the best personal statements then talk about what you've done, so the activity. So all of these wonderful things that you've been involved with, that you've been part of, led, led on, all of these things, 
daily activities. So we want to hear about those. Better personal statements then talk about the benefit to you of doing those things. So these are the skills that I've gained. So by being captain of the school hockey team, I've improved my time management, my team working, et cetera. And then the C then, course, the best personal statements can talk about the activity, the benefits of doing that activity and how that's relevant to the course. And that's something you should bear in mind, particularly when it comes to editing your personal statement. Because when you start, you think you're never going to reach the, the 4,000 characters. You're never going to fill a page of A4. But you'd be surprised how quickly that builds up. And often students have to cut things down, cut things out rather than add things in. So activity benefit course, okay? And just very briefly then, things, do's and don'ts, absolutely demonstrate enthusiasm and positivity. You should keep everything that's in that person's statement positive. Um, talking with enthusiasm about the things that you've done and the things that you want to do at university. Making sure that there's a structure. So I've given you a bit of an example structure. There's lots and lots of resources available online and um, through um, un individual university websites and also by UCAS.com and other similar sites that will give you a really good example plan for how you can structure a personal statement. Checking your spelling and grammar is really important. I can't say that one spelling error is going to mean the difference between, between getting the place and not, but we are talking about giving the best version of yourself here. And as we know, a spell check takes a couple of minutes to, to undertake. So just making sure that the final version that you submit, that you paste into that UCAS form, is, is the best one. It's, it's as, as good as it, it possibly can be. And just very briefly, things to avoid. Um, copying, really important. There's lots of examples online of good personal statements and bad personal statements. Read them if it's going to give you some inspiration, give you some, some ideas, but please don't copy anything and include it in your own work. UCAS have got a system called Copy Catch. It scans all personal statements and it will flag up if anything has been copied from a personal statement that might have been submitted in the past. So please don't put yourself in that position. Please make sure that everything that you say in your personal statement is true. I'm sure I don't need to say that, but particularly if you're going to be interviewed as part of this process, your personal statement is going to be in front of the person who's interviewing you. It's very, very difficult to keep up a lie in an interview university interview scenario. So just making sure that all of the information that goes into your personal statement, that goes into your application form is accurate and 100% true. And a, a big one just to finish is just avoiding too much talk about TV programmes. We hear from Robbie, people are watching more TV. It might be that you've been inspired to look at conservation, maybe psychology based on, you know, watching the Tiger King. Um, but making sure that the examples that you give, the things that have inspired you, have got a bit more substance to them. Um, so avoiding references to TV programmes uh, uh, where possible, please. Um, and that's it from me. I hope that was useful. I appreciate it was quite a short slot, but I would encourage you now to think about, I know there's a lot going on and there's a lot of concerns, but I would encourage you to just think about using the time that you've got at home and um, to make some notes and to kind of try and build up a little bit of a structure, a, big, a, a list of all the things you've been involved with. So when it comes to actually drafting that personal statement, perhaps in September, October, you've got a long list and a good place to start from then. Okay. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end or please type them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, absolutely uh, fantastic advice again. Um, in, again, it's so difficult to talk about something like personal statements in such a sh short period of time. Um, but wonderful, wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you very much. The reason um, we're making the sessions quite small is just unconscious of time. and I, I don't want to take, you know, you, you're very busy. Um, so we're trying to do this over lunchtime and therefore get through as much as possible in a short period of time time as possible um, another shout out for the Q&A if you have asked a question in the Q&A um, please note we, we are answering them um, there is a lot of people as part of this session which is fantastic um, and we are working through the, the Q&A questions so please keep on checking back also for anyone that hasn't posted a question in the Q&A it's a great opportunity as well to see what everyone else is, is asking so um, please do take advantage of that feature um, and then our final speaker um, today is Andy Cottrell. Um, Andy is the UK Marketing and Recruitment Officer at City University London. Um, Andy essentially is going to talk to us about universities and careers, university and courses in relation to careers uh, and give us some fantastic advice from that perspective as well. 
Um, I'll pass the floor straight away to Andy because I'm conscious of time and I want to cover some questions right at the end as well. So without further ado, um, Andy, over to you. Cool, we on. Cool, hello everyone. Hi, so my name's Andy. Yeah, I, thanks for that, John. Um, I work at City University of London. And yeah, what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about careers um, and what you might be considering when you're going to university. So I'm going to go slightly old school and put some slides on. If you bear with me just a quick second, uh, and I'll get that up and running. So hopefully you can all see that. We're going to talk a little bit today about where a degree can take you and all the different options around higher education um, and where you can end up in terms of your progression at the end of it. Now, there's some pretty big questions to start thinking about, first of all, and these can look absolutely terrifying, I appreciate. Um, first of all, you were thinking, well, what do I want to do the rest of my life? Why do a degree full stop? And why should I study that subject? How do I use it? And ultimately, how am I going to get a job at the end of it? And this can be quite daunting um, to start thinking about some of these things quite early. And by no means do you need to have all of the answers to those questions. There are people who end up here, graduated from university, and they still don't know the answer to those questions. That's absolutely fine. So you don't need to come in fresh, knowing everything that you need to know and knowing where you want to end up. The university is a bit of a process and will help you work out what it is you want to do as well. At the same time, if you have got a clear idea about where you want to go and why you want to do a degree to get you there, that's absolutely fantastic as well. It's only going to help you. What I want to have a look at this um, in sort of the next 10, 15 minutes or so is some of the myths around graduate employability as well. I'm going to try and tackle each four. And so the first one we're going to take a look at that is that everyone having a degree nowadays. So this is something that a lot of people say, like, why should I go to university? Everyone's got a degree. What's the point anymore? And it's not actually true. So there's about a 60-40 split. And in terms of the people with a degree, it's about 40% of the UK population. So less than half of people in the UK are degree educated. So it's not the case that everybody does have a degree at all. And when we look at what employers are looking for, we're looking at a situation right now where the skill shortage in the country has got worse and worse and worse. So the gap between what employers are needing and what they're getting is growing. And the expectation is that that's going to continue to grow over the coming years as well. So employers are looking for skilled people to come into their um, organisations. The good news for you, as if you're considering university, is that degrees often um, demonstrate this high level of skill. So no matter what subject it is you do, a lot of the time you'll find you develop a lot of really good skills that you can use and then apply to different careers as well. I'm going to have a look at um, some of the different areas that people go into. And in terms of the recession that started in 2008, the Leeds University Career Service put that down as 2013 was the end date for graduates in terms of that recession. So people might still struggle to find jobs in 2015, 2016, but for graduates that picture has only been getting better for the last seven years. Um, so that should give you hopefully some confidence that coming out of university with a degree is really positive and is making an impact on the job market. And the one let's have a look at is I can't get a job with that subject. And lots of people will say this all the time. Why study X, Y, Z? Because you won't get a job um, using that course. So when we look at job adverts, they often will say that they're looking for people with degrees. There's a real split between ones that want specific degrees and people who are just looking for a graduate in any area. And it's about 30% of, of jobs that ask for a really specific graduate. Now, it will be the case likely that this is people like dentists. Obviously, people will want a dentist who's got a dentistry degree. Um, so that means that there's quite specific requirements for those courses. But 70% of these graduate jobs are looking for someone with university level education but not necessarily a specific degree subject. So there's loads of different things you can do when you come out of the end of any course and any degree that you study. And it's not like that your path is absolutely set for you. So having a look at those top 10 graduate jobs, nurses is number one. And if you want to be a nurse, yes, you have to have a nursing degree. But if you want to work in marketing, which is the second most popular, you don't have to have a marketing degree at all. Those job adverts will look for people with a degree level study 
not necessarily a specific subject. And there's lots and lots and lots in that top 10 where you're not necessarily looking for specific um, subjects. Graduates will also go on to do a load of different things as well. You're likely to have numerous careers nowadays than it is numerous jobs. So you might start off working in um, marketing, for example, move over into finance 20 years later. You might go into work in teaching at some point in your career as well. It's likely that you'll do very, very various different things. And as I say, graduates will work in lots of different areas. So looking at some of the subjects in a bit more detail, if we've done accounting and finance degrees, about 60% of those will go and work in business, finance, accounting, those sorts of areas. There's also people who work as, as pilots, ski instructors, bartenders in warehouses, um, supermarkets, loads of different things that people do. And then looking at these other subjects as well, people will often say, yeah, well, I, I want to do accounting because I want to be an accountant. If I don't do it, I won't be an accountant. And we'll take a look at that example specifically later on. Yes, if you want to be a doctor, you will have to do medicine, that, and that's never going to change. But some people think then, okay, so why do history? What can I do with a history degree? There's no job attached to that at all. And no, there isn't a specific job that history graduates will go and do, but there's so many that they do go and do as well. So I had a quick look um, at what history graduates are now going on to do. And some of the things that came up were people going into teaching, there's people working as training solicitors, as surveyors, people working in insurance, uh, people working as underwriters, um, financial accountants and data analysts as well. They're so using a lot of the skills that actually you may associate with an accounting and finance degree and think, well, they won't be able to get a job in that sector. But they're using their skills they've developed as part of their course to help them get onto that um, career in the future. So you don't necessarily need to have done a degree uh, in a specific, specific area to allow you to access that profession. There are lots and lots of different routes and different jobs. A lot of people say, well, well, there aren't any graduate jobs, so what's the point? Because I don't come out with the sort of jobs that I'd be looking for. As I've kind of mentioned before, that employers do need graduates and they want graduates as well. And that's a really, really positive uh, position for people coming out of university to be in. Um, having a bit of a look at what that looks like in terms of the data behind it, um, you can see that there was that little bit of a dip um, from 2008 um, where the, um, the economy did slow down. But you can see from 2010, that middle blue line there, the graduate employability rates um, have been growing ever since. So for the last that seven years on record, graduates, have, their employability has only been increasing. And that is true across every sector of the economy, every area. Um, but the graduate employability rate is higher than those without a degree. So degrees do generally help people um, in terms of their work. Having a look a bit deeper, about 73 to 73, 74 percent of people are now in professional managerial jobs within six months of graduating. So it's about three quarters of those coming out of university, which is pretty much higher than it's ever been. Um, the graduate unemployment rate is also the lowest it's been for about the last 40 years. So your chances of getting a job as a graduate are higher than ever. Um, and more graduates are going to further study as well. So people might go and do different things. Again, they said take those history graduates, as well as them going and doing all those different jobs that we mentioned. They might be retraining into journalism. They might be going on to work in um, archaeology, perhaps, and then tailoring their history degree and something in a different direction. There's lots of different things that people will go on and do, and it's not necessarily all about the work either. Study is another option. And so the last one I want to touch on quickly is having to have something specific to work in a certain career. This is something we come up with all the time. Actually, there's loads of careers that you can go into without having a specific degree at all. So lots of people who go work in business and management, go work in information technology, finance, we've already mentioned, law and teaching as well don't have to have degrees in those subjects to go on to do those careers taking law as an example you don't have to have a law degree to be a lawyer that might be really helpful it might give you a really good grounding and it definitely kind of gives you um, a really good understanding of lots of different areas of the law that you might be interested in and that can be a real big advantage but do you need a law degree to be a lawyer? The answer is no. You can always retrain and convert uh, degrees in other subjects 
into law as well. So there's lots of opportunities there. Again, picking on the finance example, not everyone who's an accountant will have an accounting degree. They could have gone and done lots and lots and lots of different things. And actually the teaching profession is built up of people without teaching degrees. Um, your languages teacher will probably have a, a Spanish degree if they're teaching Spanish and then doing an additional teaching qualification as well. So it's built up of lots of different people with lots of different skills. And this is what makes sectors really, really successful. So I want to show you this one as well. I mentioned accounting earlier. And um, this was, I Googled um, a job description for a graduate accountant. And this is exactly what came up. Um, the first line was they were looking for a degree. I Googled graduate accountant. That's why they were looking for a degree. But the first thing it said was that was in any discipline. So not saying specifically finance, specifically business even, or even maths or economics, and let alone accounting. They are looking for someone with a degree. So a level of higher study and skill development um, from other levels of study. But it doesn't matter what that discipline is. They're looking for with good A-levels, good GCSE results as well. Um, but then they're looking for a whole host of skills. And that takes up the majority of that job description. They're looking for people who can do all these different things. And again, to use the history example, because I think this is a subject where people often think, you know, where does it take you? If you're, if you're good at working with history, you are likely to have very excellent attention to detail, as is on this job description, because you're very good at analyzing sources. You're very good at communicating things, which again is something that they're asking for. Um, so these skills that you gain through lots of different subjects are something that you can then apply to different careers as well. I think the key things to remember are that you can always retrain and you probably will always retrain as well. So lots of people will I say move into different careers, different areas of the economy as well as they go through um, their careers. But I think skills are the currency of graduates at the moment. And the more you can make the most of your skills through your time at university, whether that's through, through academic study, whether it be through some things that Rebecca mentioned as well, like doing sports, getting involved in other things as well. Very similar to the personal statement, actually. Um, lots of these job applications are looking for skills and how you develop them that's really, really important. There are graduate jobs out there, but I also want to say as well that there are no guarantees. Um, you cannot guarantee you that everyone listening today will walk out of university onto a graduate job. It's all about you making the most of your experience, developing those skills, developing yourselves, um, coming out with the results that you want to come out with at the end of it as well. So I think the top tips for me then are really to think about what it is you want to do and not necessarily worry about having the answer, but at least start thinking about that. Research all the different routes as well, um, all the different things that you can go into, and just be aware of all the options that are out there and not try and get too concerned with really narrowing down your options too early. And so you something you enjoy. And the last one I was going to end on was just that, uh, um, so my degree is in a subject that people think you won't tend to get a job in. So my degree is in French and German, so we're all speaking English now. So you could say I'm not using that every day. My degree is in communication, and I've spent a lot of the last uh, few years, and particularly the last few weeks online, um, communicating with people and talking to them. And so that's one of the skills that I really help develop um, that I now use in my everyday job. I would also say as well, I don't want to speak for Rebecca and Robbie specifically, but I'd never heard of university uh, marketing and guidance um, while I was at school. It wasn't something that I thought I can't wait to work um, with schools and colleges advising on people how to fill their student finance applications in. It's not something that I ever knew about. It's something that I found out about from going to university and really enjoyed. There's so many options out there, lots of different things that you can do. I think the step one though is to have a bit of a think, know what's out there and assess all those different options and not to panic too much if you don't know the answers. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, if I just, uh, one sec, guys, I'm just going to cancel that. Thank you. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, another great session. Thank you very much for your time. Um, what I'm going to do now, in terms of time, um, just to let people know um, our time constraints, etc. is we're going to finish this session at one o'clock. Um, during that time, we are going to continue working through the Q&A. 
Um, and in a second, I'm going to ask for an, an instru institution introduction for um, all three of our panellists. Um, Q&A update, we, we, we've answered approaching 50 questions. Um, there is, I'm afraid, still, uh, to, I'm looking now, there's, there's still about 29 outstanding. So we are doing our best to get to you um, as soon as we possibly can. But if I can just um, ask each panellist now to give a quick introduction to their institution over just one minute, so we, we have got time precious today. Um, if it's okay, I will start with Andy. Um, and, and just ask, Andy, if you can just give us a one minute introduction to City uh, University of London, please. Yeah, sure. So City um, is based uh, in, the, in the City of London. So our kind of main focus is on academic excellence for business and professions. So lots of the courses that we offer are related to specific careers. Um, so you'll find the business school, for example, business, finance, accounting. Um, in the School of Health Sciences, we, we don't offer things like medicine, but we do nursing, radiography, speech and language therapy. Um, and also on the science side, you'll, you won't find biology, chemistry or physics at City, but you will find engineering, computer science and maths as well. Um, so we've got quite a range of courses. I say we're a, quite a nice spot of London. Um, right in the centre of the city, but we also have all of our teaching in the same space as well. So students get a campus feel within right of the heart of the city as well. So it's a nice place to be. Um, and you can go and check it out online as well. We've got some virtual tours if you just want to find out more. Thank you, Andy. Um, and next I'll come to um, Rebecca, if that's okay. Can you just give us um, just a one minute introduction to the University of South Wales, please, Rebecca? I can. Thanks, John. Um, so the University of South Wales is in South Wales, as the name suggests. We're one of the largest universities in the UK and we've got three campuses. So um, we've got the Pontefree campus, which is sort of green spaces, is where our uh, student accommodation is. And that's where our um, courses such as, not just limited to these, but nursing, engineering, sport, uh, those type of things. We've got a, a campus right in the city centre in Cardiff and that's where all our um, creative industries courses are taught, so performance, music, film, design, those type of things. And finally we've got um, a third campus in the centre of Newport on the banks of the River Esk and that's where our courses in things like teacher training, social work and business are, are delivered. And um, Much the same as uh, Andy's just mentioned, I would encourage you to appreciate we can't invite you onto campus at the moment unfortunately and um, we have got a, a series of virtual open days running at the moment and you can drop into them whenever you want uh, which is, are on the website and we'll also be running some live um, Q&A webinars with academic staff over the coming weeks if you've got some questions specifically for academics about course content and that type of thing then um, please get in touch and we'd be happy to help thank you rebecca um, and it seems a long time since robbie's last um last spoken so <laughs> hope he's still here um robbie if you could just give us a quick introduction to the university of bath please Hi John, of course, yeah, I am still here. Um, and yeah, uh, <laughs> the University of Bath is based in uh, Somerset in the southwest of England. We're a campus university, so most of our services are all in one place. We do lots of the courses you'd expect. So we have science courses, engineering, uh, management courses, humanities, um, social science courses, but there's a few big things we don't do. So for example, no medicine course, I'm afraid. Um, we don't teach law either, so we're having a look online. Uh, to find out what we do. We're in a um, very historic city, Bath, very famous for its sort of historic uh, architecture. One of the big advantages of that is lots of people come and visit it, which means lots of restaurants, lots of nice places to eat, lots of places to go out. So it's a really beautiful um, city, like everybody else, uh, obviously challenges about running open days at the moment but lots of information online and fingers crossed we may be running more events uh, later in the year but there's loads of ways you can find out more about Bath now uh, if you want to um, and obviously if you want to ask any questions now you can thank you thank you Robbie and um, we have got seven minutes so if it is okay I've, I've picked out some questions that, that I can ask each um, each speaker I'll come first to Robbie if that's okay um, and Robbie, I'm conscious that this is very fresh um, to be answer, asking you this question because this is this is hot off the press news. But but one question I'm sure a lot of people are, are thinking is is about clearing plus. Um, how is clearing plus different to clearing, please? Uh, yeah, good question, John. So um, firstly, just to say, because clearing is quite confusing for a lot of people, so just to clear up clearing in the first instance, typically where universities have places left um, of results day, so sort of mid-August typically, um, they will have an opportunity effectively for students to kind of reapply, uh, usually for, for, for one, one course, and what you'd normally do is you'd ring up 
uh, you'd say, do you have any places available for history? And we'd say yes or no, and then we'd have a conversation about your grades, and that might be a way to get into university. That's the typical process. Um, there was an announcement at the weekend about a kind of acceleration of a sort of new thing called Clearing Plus, um, which there'd been quite a bit of conversation about beforehand, actually. So uh, it sort of finally happened. And I think with Clearing Plus, we're actually looking at something very similar. The difference being that it seems that a lot of what would normally be in Clearing will be kind of put in one place. Um, so effectively, rather than you having to go and find the universities that are in Clearing and then you approaching us, it looks as though what's going to happen is there will be a list of opportunities available in UCAS and, and then we might approach you uh, if you indicate an interest and that, that seems to be the main difference that we're looking at so it potentially makes clearing a little bit quicker potentially makes clearing a little bit easier um, and might bring a, bring together a range of opportunities uh, in one place but I haven't yet seen the platform I haven't seen exactly what it's gonna look like there was a suggestion that in some way universities might be suggested I don't know what that's going to be based on um, but you know in some way there will be a way that you can kind of look on UCAS and see who is available and start a dialogue from there. So just worth um, keeping that in mind. Very few students prepare for clearing. Clearing often ends up for a lot of people being something that they don't want to do because they prefer to go to their firm or insurance choice. But it's worth bearing in mind in a year where a lot of things could be quite different. It might be that there are opportunities in clearing which are really good opportunities. So engaging with clearing and thinking about what you might do when you know your results is a thing worth thinking about. It's worth everybody bearing in mind that that option exists and engaging with what's available. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and sorry to put you on the spot with that one. That's a uh, fantastically useful answer. Thank you. Um, right, a question if I can for Rebecca. Now, this is this is something that's been asked absolutely loads in the chat. Um, we've tried to answer, not sorry, the Q&A, uh, not the chat. The, we've tried to answer as many of these as possible, um, but it, it, it's all about work experience, Rebecca. And, um, a lot of people are saying that it's great to put work, get, get work experience, but at the moment, you know, given the current challenges, work experience is, is very, very tricky. Um, so um, the exact question was, um, I planned work experience in my personal statement, um, but now I'm just struggling to arrange anything. I assume this is a, it's going to be a student that's in year 13 at the moment. Uh, what, what would you suggest, Rebecca? And would it, probably more importantly, would it go against that student they haven't gotten it? Um, I think it's a really good question and obviously a valid concern, particularly because it can be quite difficult to secure work experience placements in some, some places as well. Um, what I would suggest is that, what I would first of all point out, as we've heard already, is that all universities are experiencing this kind of um, uh, challenges we're going to know that applications are coming in from students who haven't been able to access the usual kind of opportunities that they might have been able to access um, pre pre COVID and um, like I said in my uh, presentation I would suggest you looking at alternative options that might be available there's a good question in the chat about um, writing for a student newspaper and um, that be obviously a school newspaper being cancelled so what could we do so my suggestion would be thinking about blogs if there's something that you could do online where you could share that then perhaps the universities further down the line i know that universities nothing has been confirmed yet but there are universities kind of exploring um how um sort of medical um experiences could be offered online and um, through virtual tours and those kind of things so i just suggest trying to make make more of the experiences that you have got already and um, also reading you know we've got plenty of time at home at the moment reading as much as you can around your subject area articles news items videos ted talks podcasts all of those things that you can access to kind of build your subject knowledge and um, while you're you're um, lacking um, opportunities for sort of practical experience in the field then Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and always, just to let you know what's getting, the reason there's a couple of seconds of delay when it comes back to me is I need to unmute myself so you can't hear me typing and answering the Q&A questions. Um, and Andy, if I can come to you um, last but certainly not least, uh, where are we? Yeah, um, this is actually after, about after students finish university, Andy. So in terms of a student, they go to university, they graduate from university and everything's fantastic. Um, but the question is, is basically, will the university support students to find jobs after a student finishes? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is something that universities are really aware of um, as well. There's lots and lots of career support for students while they're at university. Um, we always encourage people to come to the career service right from day one. Lots of people think it's just about checking CVs and doing mock interviews in their final year. 
but all the softer stuff as well actually asking you know, what is it you want to go into what ideas do you have how can we give you more ideas and opportunities and you can do that right from year one um, careers events are held throughout people's time at university as well where employers will come onto campus to tell you more about what their um, professions are like in terms of actually finishing university like you said john um universities do will support students generally speaking after they've graduated as well some universities um, have that commitment for forever so you can always go back and access that career service and um, others will have that for a set amount of time and um, one thing i think is really useful as well is universities are very good at pushing their alumni network so people who have already been through university gone into careers coming back and giving advice or sort of 30 40 potentially years later and helping then stu guide students graduates through their employment um, journey to finding what they want to do and also helping give them some contacts people to ask mentors and um, throughout their sort of starting that career phase as well so yes absolutely there's loads of support on offer um, all the way through people's um, progression towards the job market Thank you, Andy. Um, and we've reached one o'clock. Um, so um, I'll just put my video back on. Um, so all that's left for me to do essentially is to give a big thank you to our speakers, um, Andy Cottrell, City University of London, Rebecca Bowen, University of South Wales, and Robbie Pickles from the University of Bath. Um, fantastic sessions. Also, between us, we've, we've managed to get through over 60 Q&A questions. Um, I'm conscious that there is questions that ha we haven't managed to answer. Um, the only thing I can say, I say I'm, I'm sorry about that, but for future events, we'll, we'll get more people answering questions. Um, if you've got a question that, that is really pressing um, and you really want an answer, I'll give you my word. If you email me, um, john, J-O-N, at unitasterdays.com, I will um, get an answer for you. Uh, just a, a quick plug, if I may, for our, our event next week. Again, it's at 12 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, we're new university subjects and new speakers. We join next week. Well, I'm joined next week, um, and you hopefully you you join up as well. Um, joined by Edge Hill University, uh, Pearson College College London, and the University of Leicester. So please register and join us for that. You do need to register, I'm afraid. Um, it doesn't sign you up automatically. You need to register for each event. And we are also launching subject uh, subject series events as well, which will will also be on Tuesdays, um, but later in the day, probably around three o'clock. Um, We've got a law one that's announced. Um, loads of questions about medicine in the chat today, so we're gonna we, we are gonna organise a medicine event. Um, hopefully, with a, a couple of speakers from, from different universities talking about medicine as well. Um, we will keep these events going and, and support university guidance away from the classroom um, and running these until September. Um, that is all from me. I hope you've had found this session really useful. Thank you again for our speakers for giving up um, their time and, and offering such wonderful sessions. Um, and do stay safe. Um, and fingers crossed, I'll see many of you next week. Thank you.